All right, you guys, welcome to Biodiversity, our third lecture, and we're going to do the second half of the third lecture today. Uh, so we're going to finish off our animals, okay? So first we'll do a little bit of review about what kind of characteristics do all animals share, and then we'll uh, review a little bit about body symmetry as well. And then we're going to continue our animal diversity, um, our animal kingdom, with arthropods, uh, echinoderms, and chordates. So first, if you want to pause the video and kind of review these things, or we can just go through them together. So what were some of those animal characteristics that um, they all share? And then what type of body symmetry is there? And more specifically, our little picture of our um, crawfish here, what uh, type of body symmetry does he have? Okay, so some characteristics they all share. Well, they're all multicellular organisms, right? They're all heterotrophic. They have to ingest their um, energy, right? And they're all eukaryotes. So that, those are kind of the biggies. And then we also talked about most animals undergoing sexual reproduction as well. So our little friend at the bottom here has bilateral symmetry, but we also have radial symmetry where you can split it up into uh, similar pieces and bilateral is mirror image left and right. And then asymmetrical means you cannot split it into similar pieces or in the left and right pieces, mirror images. Okay. So we talked about kind of how we separate um, our uh, classifications of animals using body symmetry um, kind of first off. We also have lots of other characteristics as well that we use. So going back to our phylogenic tree here on our animal diversity, we've talked about all of those different groups at the top. So we first um, split them up with tissues, true tissues and non-true tissue um, organisms. We talked about our sponges there. And then we talked about symmetry. So our radial symmetry friends, those cnidarians such as jellies, and then the rest of these guys all have bilateral symmetry. So we're not going to go through all the different characteristics that we're going to continue splitting up these groups, but you can definitely check out um, the link I have on Canvas for you guys for the um, Tree of Life. And so they do have those characteristics there if you're interested in what the group names are and all of that good stuff. It gets very, very detailed, so I don't want you guys to worry about that. Uh, for this class. So let's go ahead and continue. So now we're down at the bottom. We're going to start with our arthropods, which is one of the biggest uh, groups in the animal kingdom. And then we'll do echinoderms, which are our starfish or sea stars. And then we're going to get into our chordates, which is all of us. So arthropods, right? So these guys are the largest phylum of animals. So I keep calling them groups, but they're phylums. Um, and then within phylums, you have groups and subgroups. So it gets very technical, but um, don't worry too much about that, okay? So all of these guys have segmented bodies, okay? And they have this very hard exoskeleton, okay? So they have kind of a, not really a shell, but similar. And then they have jointed appendages as well. So you can see their little joints um, in their legs and their limbs, okay? So these guys, as they grow, something special about that exoskeleton is that they have to actually molt their exoskeleton as they grow, because it's kind of, Kind of like having um, a hard shell, but instead of having a skeleton on the inside of their body, their skeleton is on the outside, so it doesn't stretch, 
So whereas our skeleton kind of grows with us inside of our body, their skeleton does not grow. So as they grow inside of it, they have to shed it off or it's what's called molting. And then they grow um, a new chitinous exoskeleton. We talked about what chitin is way back when we were talking about some of our organic compounds. So it is one of our uh, polysaccharides right? Just to like we were talking about um, glycogen and starch and um, cellulose. So those guys are our other polysaccharides. Chitin is another polysaccharide. So it's made out of a polysaccharide. So our first group of arthropods are arachnids. So these guys are our spiders, our scorpions, uh, ticks, and mites. So some of these guys are poisonous, um, some are not. So you can just see the varying degrees of uh, length and body size. Dust mites are very, very small, whereas um, scorpions can get quite big. And then our spiders are at various sizes as well. So those are just some examples of our arachnids. Our next group of arthropods are crustaceans. So most of these guys are aquatic, or at least somewhat aquatic. So crabs can kind of go in and out of the water. Um, but if you've ever seen those little pill bugs up on the right hand side, I used to call them roly polies when I was little, they roll up into a little ball. Those guys are crustaceans as well. So they are earth or land. Um, animals. So those guys are one of the few that are not aquatic. So the rest of these guys are shrimps and lobsters and things like that are all crustaceans. So our next group are the millipedes and centipedes. So these guys are they look kind of like our annelids because they are uh, segmented, uh, but they have those um, appendages, those joints, those segmented joints. So unlike our worms, they have little joints, they have little legs, right? So millipedes and centipedes are quite similar. Um, but there are some rules, and if you look at their legs, the millipedes have kind of paired legs together um, in a joint, in a body segment, whereas centipedes have just uh, one pair of legs per body segment, as well as uh, most millipedes are herbivores, whereas centipedes are carnivores. So they get their um, energy from a different uh, sources as well. So. Millipedes and centipedes are fairly similar. So our fourth group of arthropods is the biggest and these guys are the insects. So they actually comprise 75% of all animals uh, in the world, which is kind of crazy to think about. And they're really the only flying invertebrates or at least successful flying invertebrates. So these guys undergo um, a metamorphosis. So they undergo kind of a larval stage. Uh, so if you ever think of a butterfly, right? So they go through kind of a um, larval stage and then they cocoon and then turn into their beautiful butterfly. So that's what a metamorphosis is, is where they change uh, shape through their uh, life cycle. So there's a bunch of orders and there's almost a million species out there. So that's 950,000 species. That's crazy to think about how many different uh, species of insects are out there. Uh, so these are just obviously a couple examples of our insect friends. And something that's cool about some of our arthropods is they have some really remarkable adaptations. And we'll talk more about uh, some of these uh, mimicry adaptations when we get to that 
a lecture, but a lot of these guys are trying to uh, startle their predators or blend in or mimic something else. So if you notice the owl butterfly has eyes on their wings to make it look like they're staring at you to kind of scare uh, predators away, or you have ones that are mimicking a stick, right? So a stick insect or this leaf mimic Katie did looks kind of like a leaf or this bird dropping like caterpillar. So it just looks like a bird do on a leaf, right? So ways to kind of blend in and camouflage themselves in their environment. So lots of very remarkable adaptations seen through um, the arthropod phylum. So our next phylum are the echinoderms. So these guys are uh, starfish or sea stars, right? Because they're not really fish. Um, they are echinoderms. And these guys are really cool. They have these little tube feet on the bottom of their uh, limbs and they function for locomotion as well as feeding and even gas exchange. So they're almost like uh, little lungs for their gas exchange. And what's really cool is in the middle of the sea star, they actually have a stomach that turns inside out uh, when they're feeding. And so if you actually watch this video I have, and I posted it on Canvas as well for you guys, but it's really cool how uh, sea stars actually eat. And you think that they may not move very fast because you can't really see them moving, but when they do move, they actually move uh, fairly quickly or quicker than you think they would. And so it's kind of this time lapse of these uh, sea stars moving and eating a mussel. So now we'll talk about our last phylum, which is also fairly large, not as large as the arthropods, but fairly large. And that's the one we belong to, and that's the chordates. So our chordates are going to include all vertebrates, and then we actually have two other subphyla of invertebrates that they include uh, in the chordate. Uh, phylum as well due to their kind of development and their um, nervous system. So what do they all have in common? So we all have a nerve cord that is dorsal. So it means it goes along the back and the nerve cord is where all of our spines come out of or spinal nerves come out of. And in other phyla, uh, sometimes the nerve cord can be uh, ventral, so on the um, bottom side of the body. So it's a little bit different. So we have to have it be dorsal um, in our chordates. And the spinal uh, cord or the nerve cord will develop into um, our spinal cord and brain in uh, some of our, in our vertebrates at least. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how these other two subphyla of invertebrates are a little bit different. So they also all have a notochord at some point in development. So it's this long flexible rod that essentially is located uh, between their digestive tube and the nerve cord. Um, in humans, uh, it's really part of our vertebrae, right, our spine. Um, so it provides kind of a skeletal support uh, throughout the length of it. Um, so in, in humans, you know, it turns into a vertebral column, but in some of these earlier or uh, subphyla invertebrates, these guys uh, continue to have a notochord. Um, in the adults, okay? So uh, we only see it in our embryos and then it's replaced by our, our vertebrae. And then um, all of these guys are gonna have pharyngeal slits sometime during development. So these guys develop into gills if they are chordates that live in the water um, or they give rise to kind of ear and other structures in the head and neck if you're a vertebrate. Um, not live, living in water. Um, we also have a post anal tail sometime during development. So whether we keep it or not just depends on uh, the vertebrate or the chordate. 
So these are all the similarities that we see between all chordates or what we have to have to be able to be considered a chordate. So a lancelot is one of the subphyla of invertebrates that is considered, as well as the tunicates or sea squirts. So the lancelots, that top right hand picture, um, is usually a marine uh, animal, lives kind of in the sand, it wiggles around, feeding time, um, and it does have all the features of a chordate. So that's why it's considered a chordate, uh, even though it is an invertebrate. So it has the notochord, uh, but not a vertebral column. And then tuna, tunicates are kind of weird because as adults, they have no notochord or nerve cord. Um, they uh, just have this kind of opening to the mouth and their stomach. So they're kind of strange, but when their larva or when they're in their larval stage during development, they actually do have a notochord and a tail and a nerve cord and even the pharyngeal slits. So again, kind of strange during development, they are kind of considered a chordate and then they turn into these weird little sea squirts. And then of course, our vertebrates, right? So we are a big group. So now we're gonna get into or create a new phylum for our chordates. So these guys um, are gonna be on your worksheet this week. So go ahead and um, remember this or you can reference this while you're doing your worksheet. So essentially we have some sort of ancestral chordate that gives rise to all of these guys. So as we go through, you can see the different characteristics that we um, have that we separate out our groups. So once we pass our two invertebrate uh, subphyla of chordates, then we see that we develop a head and that's gonna be the hagfish. So these guys are considered craniates, okay? And then we see we develop a vertebral column. So then now we are vertebrates, okay? But then within vertebrates, we have ones with jaws, right? And then ones with lungs or lung derivatives, okay? So those are jawed vertebrates. And then you see here we have lobed fins versus legs. So once we get into legs, we are now tetrapods, okay? And then we uh, talk about how we actually uh, deliver our young and reproduce. So if we have an amniotic egg, um, we are now in our amniotes. And then if we actually produce milk, uh, we are mammals. Okay. So this just kind of breaks it down for you of how we separate, separate these different groups of chordates. So let's talk about uh, vertebrates, right? So this, this is a, a big section of um, animals, right? So within the chordates phylum. So we have a cranium, right? Which encloses our brain. So it's a brain case or a skull. And we have a backbone or a spine that encloses our spinal cord, right? So the notochord is only during development. So we actually replace that notochord with a vertebral column or a backbone. And this protects our spinal cord within that vertebral column. So our first group of vertebrates are the jawless fish. So these are the hagfish and the lampreys. And hagfish um, actually have kind of a reduced vertebrae. They do have a skull, but it's made up of cartilage. And they kind of swim like a snake. And they do have a brain, eyes, ears, and a nasal opening. They do have a mouth with kind of these tooth-like uh, structures. So they do live in the water or the ocean, they're marine and they feed on kind of worms and dead or sick fish. So they can kind of be decomposers as well. So they can also be parasitic too and feed on um, other uh, 
fish and things. Whereas lampreys can either be marine or fresh water, um, and they are parasitic against other fish. So they kind of clamp their mouth down on the flank of living fish. So they don't kill the fish, they just hang on and slowly ingest uh, the fish's blood and other tissues as they're um, holding on. So that means they're parasitic, right? So they're feeding off of a lot, another live um, animal. So these guys are our jawless fish. So now we get into jawed fish, right? So jaws uh, probably evolved uh, from skeletal support of pharyngeal slits. So those pharyngeal slits that are gonna turn into gills, right? So usually that's where they're probably evolved from some skeletal support for those pharyngeal slits, okay? So if you look at kind of the development um, on the left hand side, you see that we finally get a, a hinged jaw, okay? And um, these guys are all of our bony animals and our cartilage fish, okay? Such as our sharks. So our first group of jawed fish are the cartilage, the jawed cartilage fish. So these are the sharks and the rays because their skeleton is composed of cartilage and not uh, bone. So sharks are very cool. They have a very acute uh, senses, right? So they have good sight and smell. Um, they can even detect electrical fields. So. Uh, they are very cool. Most of them are carnivorous, right? But some of the largest sharks are called suspension feeders, where they kind of just take all the plankton into their mouth um, and they eat those suspended plankton instead of um, eating um, other larger animals, okay? Uh, so these guys, and then we have some devil rays um, on the right-hand side. So these guys are all... Um, cartilage-based skeletons, but they have jaws. Right? So now we have our bony fish. So these guys have skeletons made up of bones. And so we can divide them into two different groups. And the first one is our most common uh, ray-finned fish. So this is most fish that we know and uh, you see that that's the top picture on the left hand side so their little fin ray um, and you can notice their uh, the skeletal feature of their fin is different than the lobe finned fish so the lobe finned fish um, such as the lungfish the uh, coelacanths and tetrapods, these guys gave rise probably to our early amphibians because uh, their lobed fins actually have some structures, some bony structures that are very similar to uh, limbs in our tetrapods or our early amphibians. So you can actually see a similarity and they, uh, a lot of them do use their fins um, on the bottom of the water and kind of walk. So it's kind of interesting uh, to see these guys and how they move. And so they're a little bit different than our ray finned fish because they gave rise to the tetrapods. So now let's talk about those tetrapods. So we said that they are descendants of those lobe finned fish they have four legs, so tetra meaning four, pods for legs or limbs. They have a little bit of a neck. Uh, they usually have mostly no gills and they have ears. So these guys are our amphibians and our amniotes. So it's a little bit different on um, how they give birth. So amphibians lay kind of these jelly coated eggs, right? So they don't have hard shells around them. Whereas the amniotes actually have a shell and they have an amniotic sac that the fetus develops in within that uh, shell or egg. Okay, so they can have a thick shell and they have that 
um, amnion, okay, which is how we get the amniote's name. All right, so let's go through our amphibians. So there are three types of amphibians. We've got our frogs and our toads. We've got our salamanders and our cecilians. And our cecilians are kind of cool because they're actually uh, legless amphibians. So they're a little bit different. So most of these guys undergo a metamorphosis. So they um, have eggs, those jelly-like eggs, and then they turn into little tadpoles if they're frogs, and then they develop their little legs and lose their tail and turn into a frog, right? So that's a, that's a metamorphosis. Most of these guys are semi-aquatic, so they should um, kind of stay near some water or some sort of water source. Uh, their skin actually helps their lungs do some gas exchange, and some are either com and even completely lungless. So that's kind of cool as well. They do all their gas exchange uh, through their skin, which is kind of crazy. So now we have our group of amniota. So these guys are the reptiles, birds, and mammals. So amniotic eggs contain a specialized membrane. So there's an amnion, uh, which is just a fluid-filled sac that surrounds the developing embryo. And eggs specifically um, that reptiles and birds produce are adapted for land, right? So they have a hard shell uh, with that amniotic sac developing inside the egg. So it's more for protection and um, keeping the moisture and everything inside the egg for the development. So let's first talk about our reptiles. So these are our lizards, snakes, turtles, crocodiles. These guys are reptiles. So they have many eggs and their eggs have kind of a leathery calcium shell. Um, so they're not super hard like we see maybe in our birds. Uh, so they're a little bit different. They all have scales, so unlike um, their um, amphibian friends, they cannot breathe through their skin, okay? And they're also ectothermic, meaning they're cold-blooded, so they rely on their environment uh, to heat them up, okay? So that's why you see a lot of um, reptiles uh, sunbathing, right? Sitting out in the sun to heat themselves up. So our next group are our birds, right? So now we have evolved those scales into feathers for flight. Obviously there are some birds out there are, that are flightless, but there are some adaptations that they have to make um, them lighter for flight. So they have hollow bones as well as um, kind of some interesting air sacs uh, within their thorax near their lungs. Um, so they have some very special adaptations to help them fly. They also have these harder calcium shells um, around their eggs, so they're a little bit different in their egg structure uh, than our reptiles. We're also now endothermic, meaning warm-blooded, so they can um, thermoregulate, so they can keep their body temperatures a little bit higher, um, and they don't rely on the environment as much as the reptiles. They also have some very complex mating behaviors, and they do undergo parental care. So whereas the reptiles kind of lay a bunch of eggs and kind of fend for themselves, you know, see who wins or who survives. Um, these guys do undergo a lot of parental care and it kind of depends on the species of bird um, for how much. So I have this cool video um, on canvas with some mating behaviors. Uh, so we talked a little bit about uh, sexual selection when we were talking about, um, you know, natural selection and these weird mating behaviors that a lot of these males undergo, right? So just like the P 
peacock with the crazy feathers, we see some of that um, in these birds of paradise very specifically are known for their um, complex mating behaviors. A lot of them dance and sing and have these very cool displays uh, for the females to show um, their fitness and all of that. So then the female chooses uh, based on um, how good their dance is or whatever, how good their song is. So kind of a cool video and it's kind of crazy what these birds do. So because um, you can kind of see some of them in this picture with their crazy feathers and their dances and things like that. So it's kind of fun to watch. So now let's talk about us. We are mammals. So what makes us mammals? We no longer have scales or feathers. We have hair. So we have hair. We also have uh, mammary glands, which produce milk. So that's a big one. And then we also are endotherms, just like the birds, but we have a very high metabolism. So some birds do have very high metabolisms as well, but uh, we specifically have very high metabolisms. So these are the three things that um, all mammals have. So let's look at some cool different mammals that you may not think are out there, but we do have some egg laying mammals. So we actually have one species of platypus and four species of echidnas. And if you are like, what the heck is a platypus and an echidna? Well, they're very interesting mammals. So I have a video on echidnas out there because a lot of people don't know what echidnas are. So they are egg laying mammals, these guys, and they're the only egg laying mammals. Uh, and they do produce milk uh, from some glands in their belly. So they um, lay their eggs and they usually carry the egg kind of around with them until it uh, hatches and then the little um, developing baby stays with them and drinks the milk um, on their belly. So kind of a cool species if you want to check out the video of echidnas. So we also have pouched mammals. So we have some that are egg laying and some that are pouched and these guys are marsupials. So these are our possums, kangaroos, koalas. They do have um, nipples for milk as well. So they give birth to young um, that are very um, early in development. So their gestation time is very short and they actually continue to develop inside that pouch. So they are, um, they're developed very, very, um, or they're given birth to them very, very early on in their development so they cannot uh, survive without being inside the mother's pouch. And then inside the pouch, they have uh, their nipples for milk. So definitely very cool species as well. And I have a fun video on kangaroos also uh, to show you kind of the development um, that the fetus or that the um, offspring undergo in that pouch. And then we have our placental mammal. So that would be us, right? So we have a very complex uh, placenta, which allows for a longer gestation because the placenta is going to uh, sustain the developing fetus. Uh, so we have a very long gestation and they actually complete that development inside the mother uh, while that placenta nourishes it. So. Um, obviously there's varying lengths of gestation. You know, we have a nine month gestation, but if you look at the elephant, they have a 22 month gestation. That's almost two years, if you can imagine that. And there's some in between, like horses are 11 months, so that's almost a year. So definitely, obviously very different in our gestational lengths, depending on the species, but um, it's a lot longer than our marsupial friends. 
All right, so obviously that was a big whirlwind of animal diversity. There's so many um, animals out there that are so cool. And if you're really interested in this topic, you can take another class that's more specific for animal diversity, and that's biological anthropology. So if you want to take that, you are welcome to it. So we kind of just touch on it a little bit to give you an idea of the different uh, phylums that are out there. Um, in the animal kingdom and what the kind of differences are and how we classify everything. So what group are you in, right? So if you want to um, kind of get very specific with which domain, obviously which kingdom we're in, and then you can get um, more and more specific and you can use the notes um, from this lecture to help you and um, just to get a good idea, you know, might be a question. So you will use this lecture though for your worksheet this week. So make sure uh, you take good notes and you have it uh, with you to do that worksheet this week. So if you have any questions, let me know and I'll see you guys later.